I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we started last week talking about the spiritual discipline of fasting. And we remember we, the personal disciplines are meditation, that's sitting still and listening to God, prayer, and that's where we talk with God. We share with Him what we want Him to do or ask Him what He wants us to do. That is us communicating with God. So it's both speaking and listening. And then fasting is, and if you look on the back of your bulletin this morning, I kind of give you a primer on fasting. It's something we don't know how to do. We just, we do not fast. It's not something that we as Baptists really have ever practiced that much. So many people do ask, well, how do I start this? Well, I'm not going to walk through that in the sermon this morning, but on the back of your bulletin, I give you the steps of how you, this is something that you just like exercising, running, or anything that you do, you start slowly and you build up to it. And in his book, Celebration of Discipline, Discipline Dr. Richard Foster says that you, build, you begin with just that 24 hours, and then some people even begin with they fast from solid food, but they drink fruit juices, and, and then some work up to the one day, and then the three days, and some will do a seven day, and some of them will even go and do 40 days like Jesus did before he began his ministry. You let the Lord lead you in this. I guess I have to put the disclaimer in here for insurance purposes. If you, um, before you begin fasting, especially lengthy fast, uh, if you are diabetic, if you are pregnant, if you are nursing, if you, the, all those things, you know when you go to ride a roller coaster, all those things it tells you to worry. If you're this, don't ride this roller coaster. If you are any of those things, you have any kind of medical problems, talk with your doctor before you begin practicing fasting because it can affect, especially diabetics, diabetics or people who have low blood sugar, it can, it can throw you off a little bit. So use, your, use caution here. But I give you kind of an example on the back of the bulletin of how you start this. So I'm not going to teach you that in the service this morning, but we're going to look at the importance of that and what the emphasis of fasting really should be. So before we go to God's Word, let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer. Lord God, thank you for who you are, not just in our lives, but in everyone's life. And Lord, we thank you that we can come together as your church and worship together and most importantly, hear your word and hear the message that you have for us. And Lord, this is something that's very different for most of us in here, something we've never really practiced. And, and many times, Lord, I think many times we have passed over this in scripture because we really don't understand it. And so Lord, help as your words come out, Lord, help through your Spirit in us to clarify this for us and help us to understand not so much that we should fast or how to fast, but the why of fasting. Because, Lord, that's the message that Jesus gives in the text this morning of why we are fasting and who we are fasting for. So, Lord, as we go through your word, help us hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching. This is his Sermon on the Mount. And he's been teaching a lot of things that are Old Testament, but he, he's putting a new twist on them. And because the Pharisees and the religious practice, practitioners of Jesus' day had modified things or changed things or discarded things or added things that were confusing to people. And so Jesus was clarifying a lot of things in the Sermon on the Mount. And just before this passage, he teaches his disciples how to pray, and then he moves into fasting. Now understand that the religious people of Jesus' day did practice. The Pharisees practiced fasting twice a week. On Mondays and Thursdays, they fasted. So they were practicing this. People in Jesus' time practiced fasting regularly, so they knew how to fast they knew why to fast, and so uh, this is Jesus is not giving us a text on how to fast. He's telling us to fast, expecting us to understand how to do this. And so Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they, they neglect their appearance so that they may be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full, in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. 
title of the sermon this morning is Fasting. Who are you fasting for? For whom are you fasting? God or man? See, the Pharisees fasted on Monday, Thursday. You know why they did Monday and Thursday? There's no spiritual significance to this. There's no speciality in the fact, oh, Monday. For us, Monday is our first day of our work week. Well, it wasn't for them. Saturday was their Sabbath, and so it was actually the second day of the week for them. So why, what was special about Monday and Thursdays? Monday and Thursdays were market day. Monday and Thursday is when everybody would come down to the center of the city, wherever the market was, and do their shopping. So Monday and Thursdays, there were more people gathered around in the city and out and about. So if I fasted on Monday and Thursday, guess what? More people got to see me fasting. More, more people got to see me being pious and holy. And so the Pharisees, what they would do, he says hypocrites here, but he's talking about the Pharisees. And by the way, a hypocrite is just anyone who says one thing and does another. Matter of fact, that word hypocrite in the Bible, in, in the Greek, actually is the word they use for actors who would wear masks and portray a character. So they were pretending to be something that they were not. And so that's where the word comes from. So anyone who says, well, I do, oh yeah, I do this, but their actions are different from their words, that person's a hypocrite. And the Pharisees would, on Mondays and Thursdays, they would not adorn themselves, they would not fix themselves up in the morning. They would just get up out of bed and they would, they would leave their hair a mess and sometimes they would put ashes on themselves. Sometimes they would wear sackcloth, but most of the time they just didn't prepare themselves and they would, be, they would go out into the streets and, and people would know when they saw, oh, they're fasting. It had become a habit, it had become a ritual and therefore people would look at them and say, oh, look how holy they are. They're, they're fasting. Look, oh, man, I, I wish I had the discipline and the piety and the spirituality to fast like them. I mean, they, they were doing it to show people. You know, we looked a couple of weeks ago at prayer and how the Pharisee would stand on the, in, in front of everybody and he would pray about how wonderful he was. And Jesus condemned that. He, we're, we do what we do spiritually for God and for God alone. And so Jesus changes everything here. He says, when you fast, instead of neglecting your appearance, he says, adorn yourself, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men. He, he said, just go about your life as normal. Don't call attention to it. Now, you know, one of the things that's difficult about fasting for us is that our, we have a culture that revolves around food to a large extent. I mean, think about that. If you, said, if you were at work on Tuesday or Thursday this week, and somebody said, oh, it's lunchtime. You want to go to lunch? No, I'm not going to go to lunch. Well, what? You always go to lunch with us. How come you're not going to lunch? Well, well I'm just not going to go to lunch today. I'm fasting. You know, it, it, that'd be weird to kind of say, well, I'm fasting. And, and so it's in, we have a culture that if you... If I didn't show up for breakfast at fr on Friday mornings, people, so, so there's some people that think, what's, what's going on? Where's Robert? What, what's happening? Because I always go to breakfast Friday mornings. And if it's like, well, I'm fasting. I will not fast on Fridays. I'll just tell you that. That's my breakfast morning. So I will not fast on Friday. But he, Jesus said, when you go fast, make sure you do it for God and not you. And this is where we need to look at what is the focus of fasting? Why did the Bible teach us to practice fasting? And it's very, very simple. It's not hard to understand. We, we fast so that the time that we use to prepare a meal, to eat a meal, to, to clean up after a meal, we take that time and we spend it with God. Remember in their day, you didn't just get up, throw something in the microwave for two minutes, and it, you ate a meal. I, I can have a meal prepared and eaten probably in less than three minutes. Now, I tend to eat fast, but I, I mean, you know, I can swing through McDonald's or Wendy's or wherever, get my meal, and before I, you know, b before I drive to wherever I'm going next, in the next three to four minutes, the meal is gone. So, I mean, we can eat very fast. So it doesn't take a lot of time for us, but in Jesus' day, preparing the meal, especially for the women, was a long, complicated process. There was a lot that was involved in that. You had to get everything. You had to grind everything. You had to prepare it, get it ready, get the fire ready. Bake. I mean, there was a lot to it. And so on the days that they fasted, they were able to cut large blocks of time out of their day. And that time was to be spent 
with God. Because that is what fasting is all about. It is setting aside time in my day and not doing something that I normally do in order to spend that time with God in prayer, meditation, in study, listening to Him. That, that is simply what fasting is all about. It is all about focusing myself on God for that period of time and not on myself and not on the things of this world. Next Sunday, I won't be here next Sunday, but next Sunday on the back of the bulletin, I'm going to have a list of things that you, you might want to think about fasting from. Because, see, fasting, while it specifically re- uh, is applied to food, in today's culture, I think there are a lot of other things that we could fast from. Because think about what takes your time. I like to fast from work. Of course, I only work one day a week, so that's kind of hard to do. Uh, you know, what takes your time? Because most people say, well, work takes my time. Sleep takes my time. Um, I don't carry my cell phone when I'm up here. Cell phones, Facebook, Internet, YouTube, video games, uh, golf, um, exercise. Th- think of things that are in your life. That, and they can, they're not bad things. Not, those, none of the things I listed are bad. But think of things in your life that take up your time. Shopping. 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 <laughs> takes your time and your money. Think about things that takes up your time. And what if you said this next week, okay, I'm going to cut back on this. I mean, most people spend a lot of time sleeping. What if you said this next week, that I'm going to fast from sleeping on one day. And I'm going to get up an hour earlier, and I'm going to go to bed an hour later. And take those two hours in in the morning and in the evening and spend with God. Now, you may be cranky the next day. I don't know. I don't know if you're one of those that can function on little or no sleep. But I'm going to give you a list next Sunday of different things that you can fast from in your bulletin. So that you can begin looking at not only food, but here's other things I should fast from. But I do believe, and Dr. Foster in his book still believes, that that food fasting is important for us as Christians to continue to practice. And so I'm going to challenge you this week. And I'm going to do this too, okay? And you know, this this is this is going to be tough. But I'm going to challenge you to begin this week, pick a time and begin to fast. And, And set the time and the day that works for you. And on that day, think about God. And here's one of the things that you will find. Whenever, if if you've never fasted, then you're going to find after 8 or 10 hours that your belly is going to growl, more than likely. It may not take that long for you. but, But here's a great thing to do. Whenever you feel those hunger pains, whenever your stomach growls, whenever you think about food, man, it's time for me to eat. Immediately, Focus on God and talk to Him and listen to Him. You may want to keep a Bible handy with you during your day on that day, whether it's at work or at school or wherever. And whenever you, you think about hunger, pull out your Bible and, and read, read in your normal Bible reading and take that time to do that. Again, now if you have any kind of health problems, you need to check with your doctors before you do this. But what if, what if Christians began to set aside time every week to fast and spend more time with God. And not just talk to Him and not just listen to Him, but actually obey Him when He tells us what to do. Because if you look through Scripture, fasting always took place when someone was seeking real guidance from God. Remember, Jesus began His ministry, His earthly ministry, After his baptism, he went and for 40 days he fasted in the wilderness. No food. Because it says at the end of that 40 days he was hungry and Satan came to him and tempted him and said, turn these stones into bread. So for 40 days Jesus ate nothing. Probably drank water. The Bible doesn't say one way or the other. But for 40 days he fasted. Why? Because he was getting himself spiritually ready. He was God in the flesh, yes, but he was still flesh. And so he was preparing his body and his life to begin the three years of ministry that would lead him up to the cross. 
And so there were, this was important. And so he prepared himself through fasting. And you can look all through the Scriptures. And every time that fasting took place, it was, it was before something big was going to happen. Uh, the, the children of Israel called fast. We looked last week at Esther and Mordecai. And because they were about to be executed, possibly, then they fasted for three days, neither food nor water. So when, when they really needed to hear from God and get direction from God, they set aside time and fasted as a people. So as you fast as an individual, you need to be asking God on those days that you fast the big questions in your life. Because we all have big questions in our life. We all have something that we're struggling with. Maybe there's a particular sin that we struggle with that we really know God wants to remove for our life. Then that may be your focus as you fast. God, show me how. Help me f- focus on that. It may be a decision about your future, a direction. that You're not sure if this is where you need to move or go. And, and, and you set aside that time and you really focus on that. Fasting gives you an opportunity to really focus on that big decision that's coming that you know is out there and how God wants you to handle it. Taking that time and doing that. But fasting leads us to spiritual rewards instead of earthly rewards. And that's what Jesus, he goes immediately from fasting into verse 19. He talks about for where our treasures are. Matthew 6, 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Why do you think Jesus started this next section right after fasting? Because when we eat food, we store up. And I've been storing for years, people. And i got plenty stored up. But when we... Food in their day was about store. You ate to get the energy and have what you needed for that. And as the harvest was good, people would eat more because they would store things to get through the winter. But by the end of the winter, the covers were getting bare. The wheat was running out. And so they, they ate good when the times were plentiful because they knew there would be times that were lean. And so Jesus understood that they would be thinking and fasting about the fact of storing up and and. Where are they storing their treasure? And Jesus said so many people in the world in his day stored up for themselves earthly treasures. Let me ask you this. Think of your favorite thing. Thing, not person or anything like that. Think of your favorite thing, the thing you, you treasure the most. It could be your car, it could be a ring, it could be your video collection, it could be whatever. You know, it could be your phone. I, I don't know. I don't know, what you, I don't know what type of things that you tre- treasure the most. You know, it could be a golf club, it could be a fishing reel, um, wh- whatever it is. It could be shoes, purses, you name it. But a thing that you really like, and if it, and if it suddenly disappeared from your life, it would bother you, okay? And th- th- there's nothing bad in this, okay? Don't, don't think, oh, wow, there's stuff. No, don't think about it. It could be something special. I have a I don't know if I should, no, I don't know if I should say, I don't have a Foyd card, but I have a shotgun, so I, I don't know if I should put this on TV or not, the <laughs> government may be coming out, but my grandfather had a shotgun, that, and it doesn't fire anymore, so I guess I'm okay with owning it, but it, it, you can't really use it because it's really old, but it, it was a unique shotgun, and I have that shotgun at my house, and so I wouldn't want to lose that, it's not something I treasure necessarily, I didn't get to know my grandfather, he passed away before I was born, so it's something I have from him, uh, the grandfather I never got to know. And so if, if some, our house got blown away in a tornado or a fire or something like that and it got burned up, I would miss it. It's something that, yeah, I would want to keep safe if possible, but it's not something that I would miss terribly. So something like that. Now think about it. Are you that thing that you treasure the most? When you die, where is it going to be? Now, you may leave instructions to put that shotgun in the casket with me. You, you may leave instructions to that. I mean, I've, I've heard people throughout the years who have left instructions to have th- weird things, to me, weird things, strange things put into their caskets. And, and, and that's okay. That's whatever they want to do. You can, put whatever, you can put whatever you want to in that casket, but guess what? It ain't with you. 
When, when, you, when you pass from this world into eternity, what are you going to take with you? Absolutely nothing. People will spend a lot of time picking out the dress or the suit that they want to be buried in. Really? Really? You ain't going to know if they put you in it or not. I mean, I mean people, I've heard people going out and buying new clothes to put on their father, grandfather, whomever, to be buried in. None of that's going with you. It, it, it's not. I mean, the this, this, this story was told, I, th- I don't know if I've shared this one. I've shared so many jokes through the years. I don't know if I've shared this one or not. But the story was told about a man who was very wealthy. And three young, three young men that were up and coming, he, he agreed to loan them some money. And he says, I loan you this money. He gave each of them $100,000. And he says, I, I give you this money with only one condition. At my funeral, you are to take the money and put it in my casket so I can take it with me. Now, we know he can't take it with him. But, and it, went, it was a doctor, a lawyer, and a preacher. And, and they all used the money for college and school and things like that. And so the man eventually died. And the, the doctor had a great practice, and he was doing very well. And so he came by the casket, and he took an envelope that had $100,000 in it, and he laid it there in the casket. And then the lawyer came by to pay his respects, and he took an envelope that had $100,000 in it and put it in the casket. And the pastor came by and did the same thing. And closed the casket. Funeral was over. They put the body in the ground. And they had kind of gathered there at the grave as... as uh, Everybody had left, and they were talking, because they were all given this money at the same time. They had kept in touch with one another. And the doctor looked, and he said, you know, he said he did a lot for me. That $100,000 kick-started. I was able to pay off a lot of my medical, a lot of my school loans, and get my practice started, and I've been very successful, and, and I've made more. Than that. But he said, boy, it was hard putting that $100,000 worth of cash in that casket. That's just, you know, that, that was tough. But he said... But it was his. He gave it to me, and he asked for this, and I respected him, and I did that. Lawyer said the same thing. He said, you know, I've got my own practice, and we have flourished, and we've done really well, and it happened because I had that $100,000 to start with. And, and he said, yeah, it was, it was tough to pull that money out of the bank this week and put it in that envelope knowing I needed to put it in that casket. But you know what? Without it, I never would have made it. I don't know if I'd have made it in law the way I have. And they looked at the pastor, and the pastor said, yeah, it was tough, but I wrote that check for $100,000 and I put it in that envelope and dropped it right there in that casket. <laughs> Might better stop payment on that check. <laughs> you don't think preachers are tight? Yeah, you're not taking it with you. And Jesus knew that and he understood that. He said, where is your treasure? Store for yourself treasures in heaven when we fast when we pray when we study god's word those are things that we will carry with us for eternity those are things that when i listen to god and obey him here there's a reward that and i don't know what that's going to be and i don't care what that's going to be but there is a reward for me in heaven when i obey him here with the, the first and most simple is when I give my life to Jesus at the moment of my salvation, now I have eternity secured in heaven because I have trusted Him and am following Him for my salvation. That is the start, and that is the greatest treasure that we can have in, the, in heaven is that we have eternal life with Him. But the Bible teaches that as we obey Him and serve Him here, that He is recording those events and He is storing up for us treasures in heaven and I don't care what it is and I don't care how big it is when I get there but I know it'll be there when I get there when I serve him faithfully here and Jesus' point was there in verse 21 for where your treasure is there your heart will be also the things I value most is where my time my attention my actions will be focused And Jesus wanted us to focus on the things of God and not the things of men. And he finishes that with verses 22 and 23 and 24. He says, The light is the lamp of the body, so then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The eye what I'm focused on, what I'm 
paying attention to. Where my eye is, is either going to be bringing light into me or darkness into me. The things I focus on, the things I spend my time with, those either are going to be for God or for the world. One or the other. And there are things in this world that I can do to serve God. And there are things in this world that if I do, will never serve God. There are things I can do that may not benefit the world at all, but serve God. But many of the things that that I do in following Jesus in this world will have not only benefits eternally, but benefits here. When when I help someone who's hurting, when, when I pull a car out of a ditch, when I help a neighbor cut his grass because he's been sick, When I go and prepare a meal for someone who hasn't been able to give the house. There's so many things that we can do to serve others. And and they have a worldly benefit here. We'll get thank thank yous and praises and those from the people around us. But the eternal benefit is so much more. And it just takes time from us. One of the disciplines we're going to talk about a little further down the road is service. Serving others. And, And you can't truly learn to serve people until you truly learn to serve God first. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Let your focus, let your eyes be on the things of God so that you will have light and not darkness in your life. Because he closes that with verse 24, which is so important. He says, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and, depending on your translation, New, New American Standard says wealth. The word in the, in the Bible, in the original language, was either mammon or mamma. And, and basically that was literally wealth, things of this world, things of value in this world. You can't serve God in wealth. Now that doesn't mean you can't be a godly person and have wealth. That doesn't mean that if you're poor, you're a godly person. It doesn't equate in that way. Don't, don't be scared of that. Don't be afraid of money and things. But the, the, the difficulty is where is your focus? Are you serving God in such a way that through the things you do, you acquire wealth? That's just something that you acquire as you're serving God. And you give it away and you use it for God's benefit, but it, you have that in your life. Or... Are you serving wealth and never focusing on God? Ron Blue is a Christian financial counselor, and people ask him all the time. He said, uh, Ron, how do I know when I have enough money saved? How do I know when I'm ready for retirement? How do I, you know, because how how do I know? How do I know when I've got enough money to retire? Well, my my question that, Ron didn't say this, but my question that, who said we were supposed to retire? I mean, a lot of you in here are retired. I'm not condemning you, uh, you know, I, that, but who said we're supposed to retire? That's not a biblical concept. Nothing wrong with it. If you can retire, retire. But that, who, who said that we were supposed to? I don't think we're ever supposed to quit doing things until we go to heaven. I don't think we were meant to sit back and do nothing. So, but that's another sermon. But Ron Blues said he's asked all the time, how do I know when I have enough to retire? He says, I don't know. I cannot give you an answer for that. Everybody is different. For some people, if they have $100,000 in the bank when they retire, that is more than enough for them because of their lifestyle, who they are, what they do. That's more than enough. Some people, if they had $10 billion in the bank with their lifestyle, that wouldn't be enough because they spend money like it's water. So he said, it just depends on who you are. He says, but I can tell you this. I can't tell you when you have enough, but I can tell you when you have too much. He says, you have enough when you... I'll just pull my wallet out. He says, you have... He says, you have too much when your hand does this. You know, I've got this is my money. When you, when you won't let it go. He said, as long as you hold your money with palms open, and God, it's, thank you for giving me this, thank you for blessing me with this. Lord, however, do, I need, do I need to do something with this? Is there some way I can help someone or help do something? And as long as you hold your wealth, with your palms open, ready to give it all away, if God should ask you to, he says, you're okay. But whenever you clench your fist and you grasp your money and you won't let it go, he says, then you have trouble. 
then you have too much. Then your heart is in the wrong place because you can't take it with you. And if you begin to grasp your wealth, you're serving the wrong master. God or wealth? Because whatever we hang on to, that's who our master is. Now, I, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't plan for the future. I'm not saying you shouldn't prepare for the future. I think God teaches us good stewardship. I think God teaches us to prepare for tomorrow. Uh, but you shouldn't be consumed with it. It's okay to prepare for retirement 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 10 years from now. But if you won't give a cup of cold water to someone who's thirsting today because you've got to save it for tomorrow, then you're serving the wrong master. When we fast, we begin to realize who the true master is. Let's pray. Father God, help us, help us to understand who we truly worship. And Lord, it may not be money and it may not be wealth. It may be other things. It may be people we see on TV. It may be people that we are around. It may be our family. Lord, there's so many things that can come between us and you. So Lord, help us truly examine our lives. See who, who we truly worship, who our true master is. And Lord, if it is not you, if as we examine our life, we realize that we have not put you first and foremost in our lives, then Lord, help us correct that mistake. Help us change our lives in such a way that you are first. You are our master. And give you all the praise and all the glory for everything that comes into our lives. And God, when we do that, you will continue to bless us. You will continue to use us. We will continue to to be your servants in this world. Lord, help us see whom we're worshiping in this world. In Jesus' name we pray.